This is Lukadowski of We Are Changed at Oregon. Today we have the distinct honor and pleasure to be joined by the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only G. Edward Griffin, uh, a very important scholar, the man who wrote Creature from Jekyll Island. And in this video, we're going to be talking about a lot of important information that you need to know regarding cancer, the Cancer on Society, Red Pill University, solutions, and so much more. But first of all, first of all before we start, uh, Mr. Griffin, you've done so much incredible work for so many decades now. I'm wondering, from your kind of perspective, are we freer than we were before? Are we more divided than we were before? What is your kind of analysis and understanding of the current situation of humanity from where it was before? Yeah, well, I think that's a pretty easy uh, question to answer because uh, if you have any kind of historical perspective and you can mentally rewind your, your consciousness back to, say, even 10 years ago, but it's certainly if you go back 20 or 30 years ago, you can see that our freedom to, uh, to act, to say things, our freedom to earn a living in the way we want to, our freedom to travel, all of our freedoms are greatly reduced to what they were, and it's a continuum. It just continues that way, and it's, it's accelerating at the present time. So, uh, yeah, we, this is a growth of, uh, we're living in an era of growth of government control and regulation, all supposedly for our own good, you understand. They keep telling us that because we have terrorism out there and we have drugs out there and, and we've got pornography out there and all these bad things. So um, we have to be content with giving up our liberties in order to gain our security. I mean, that's the party line. And unfortunately, many people are buying into that because they think it's real. Now, I think a lot of it also has to do with kind of psychology and propaganda and misinformation with either corporations or government or the powers that be using our own kind of weaknesses, using our own kind of uh, emotions against us. What do you think is the biggest purveyor of this kind of bigger divide and conquer agenda, this kind of bigger eliminating of our freedom? Well, I'm glad you said the purveyor because that too is easy to see. It's our media. It's our, uh, I guess we call it the mainstream media. I don't think it's mainstream anymore. It's dominant, that's for sure, but it doesn't represent the mainstream of America. Its purpose, I think, has become to uh, engineer the mainstream, to change the thinking of the mainstream people. And, uh, and it's doing a good job, by the way. Uh, and here again, it's easy to see that happen. I remember not too long ago where the, the mainstream media, as we call it now, was pretty well being able to uh, hide behind the facade that it was neutral. It went to great uh, uh, strides to preserve the appearance, at least, of being neutral. And uh, it was very effective when they were doing that because people said, well, here, they've looked at both sides and uh, they're honest people and so we'll be influenced by their opinions and their direction. But now it's all out in the open. I mean, they're obviously participants in the debate. They're activists themselves. They are the contestant. They're on this, they are one of the contestants. And, and yet some people still have forgotten <laughs> that the, to look at that. They still think that the media is uh, neutral. So anyway, to answer your question, it's, it's clearly the media and uh, that leads to the other issue, which is the rise of the alternative media. And again, I hate to even use that word alternative, although that's the one we use. It's, it's the rise of the new media, I would call it. And, uh, and, and you yourself are a major part of that, you see. And it's, it's the, one of the great advantages of the technology we have with uh, the internet and um, all these smartphones and you know, wireless this and wireless that. And we can, as little individuals, have our voice get up there into the airwaves and, and it's very democratic because people can choose. Well, the powers that be don't like that very much. And of course, they're trying to clamp down on the internet, clamp down on broadcasting, clamp down on everything in the name of protecting us from terrorism and pornography and crime and all of that, because that's the trick that people fall for. But they're just working as hard as they can to put more and more controls on even the new media. Mm -hmm. This is a very dangerous thing happening because they could succeed. And it depends on how vigorous uh, we are in pushing back. 
I couldn't agree with you more because information and knowledge and, and power are the most important thing. Truth could bring down corporations and the empire, and it's critically key for these people to control the narrative. And we saw the internet when it first came out. It it red pilled and, and woke so many people up to the real issues that really was concerning everyone and now we're kind of seeing it being more restricted and I, I, I kind of do see kind of weaponized information pushing people either to the extreme left or the extreme right also with supposed independent media now today um, so I just wanted to get kind of your take on this Antifa versus alt-right fighting over statues fighting over uh, these kind of celebrities fighting over things that really have no effect on our lives. What is your take on this kind of bigger divide and conquer happening right now? I think that's a very important issue that you've touched there. It, it should be obvious to anybody that stands back a little bit and, and uh, looks at the scenario out there that the, um, the high visibility of the so-called alt-right and the so-called alt-left what is the basis of that? It's high visibility. Every time you turn on your television set uh, or even go, or go on the internet, there are all these feeds up there, you see the, you know, the Antifa against the white nationalists and all this stuff and the statues coming down. It's, it's theater. It's good theater. Uh, and now, why is it good theater? Some people would say, well, it's because it sells. And so the media does that simply because that's how the stupid public wants to to be entertained or they want to be scared just like looking at a horror movie kids like ghost stories because it scares them you know and there's some <laughs> I'm sure there's some truth to that I used to tell ghost stories to my kids they loved it you know oh that was scary <laughs> well I think that the public is in a little bit uh, in a category like that but I don't think that's the main thing that's going on uh, when you look at these groups on the so-called right and left Who's financing them? Are these just uh, rank and file people that have regular jobs and they are all on fire because of their ideology and their, their uh, affinity to some issue? No. All of them, well, the ones, the leaders that you see on, on uh, television being interviewed, they're all working for some school. They're always on the payroll of some university. So they're, they're uh, or some grade school even now in high schools, they're all on the public payroll, but they're just the organizers. And you look at all of these people and they're professionals. They're professionals. And we see some of these same Antifa people showing up in one city and the next city and they're bussed around. Well, where is this all coming from? Where's the money coming from for this? Well, even that is not hard to find. Uh, we all know this. Our good friend George Soros is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into these kinds of organizations. And then there, the, 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 most of that money goes to the so-called left, but there's another source uh, of money that's going m more obscure, going to the so-called right, and that's coming from the deep state. I think it's, I'm going to guess it's probably coming from the CIA or something that we don't even know what its name is. And, okay, now this is my opinion, based on, I've done a lot of study of the strategies of these things over the years, so it's, just, it's my opinion only, that I think that both sides are being financed by the group that wants to convert our nation into a totalitarian system. And they're financing both sides for the so sole purpose of creating as much chaos and hatred and animosity and violence as they can. They can't do it all across the country, so they pick their spots and they make sure the media is there, and then they bust their people in. And then they put on a little war, and it's, it's theater, but it looks very real when you're looking at the television set and you see, oh my gosh, this happened in Cincinnati. Now look what's happening in Detroit. Oh, in Florida now, and so forth. And so the average viewer says, oh, the whole country is burn, burning apart. It's coming apart, burning up. When in reality, it's theater. And why are they doing that? I think they're doing it because they want the semblance of civil war. And actually, they're trying to bring about real civil war. They're trying to trick uh, innocent people into it. They, they get fed up watching this stuff and they, they look at one side or the other depending on what their viewpoint is and these, this theater is creating genuine animosity and hatred. It's creating hatred. So that I think what they want is the rednecks to come out and all the extreme lefties to come out and start killing each other. So the real goal that they're after is say, ah, you see how much violence there is out there? We must declare martial law. And so many Americans will say, oh, thank goodness you finally solved the problem. And they don't realize that martial law has been the goal all along. And that's the reason they're doing it. That's my analysis of it.
Yeah, it's a perfect Hegelian dialect of problem, reaction, solution, which we've been talking about a very long time on this YouTube channel. And more people are saying, well, we need a bigger police state. And we've seen Donald Trump with his legislative actions meet those kind of concerns and needs from the people. And in reality, we're all losing, fighting over statues. Meanwhile, uh, the middle class is being eviscerated. We're being bankrupted with all these foreign wars. There's no anti-war movement. Our food and water supply is being poisoned. Cancer is going up. Male, male infertility is going up. Uh, and there's, there's a corporate government war against humanity. And, and, and people are like, oh, oh, but there's a statue over there. <laughs> it's like, ah, I just want to tell people to wake up. And, and kind of moving on to the next subject, you also did, you know, kind of work in understanding cancer and understanding some of uh, the solutions towards that. Would you mind just sharing your kind of research and, and the information that you talked about that? Because I think this is an important aspect for people to understand since, in, since it, it affects all of us, but not many people know exactly what's happening. Yeah, that too is a really uh, important topic, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because I don't get too many opportunities. To, and people don't ask me about that. They're more interested in what's happening in the street. But uh, when you think about it, there's more death and destruction and suffering going on in hospital wards and in the bedrooms of dying people around the world, uh, certainly in the United States, from cancer. So you're talking about a great challenge to humanity. There it is. So I got into this some years ago quite by accident. I had no background in medicine, had no interest particularly. I thought, well, I'm young, I'll get along, and uh, when I get sick, I'll go to the doctor and he'll fix me up. That was kind of my ready-made attitude, and <laughs> I, looking, looking back on it, I realized how that was kind of fed to me, too. I was, I was trained to believe that. Well, now I realize that I think we all have a responsibility for our health, and we can't just slough it off to others, because if you do that, you're, you're running a risk of, of becoming victimized, because there are powerful, I learned, there are powerful commercial interests in the health industry. And the cancer component of that is probably the most powerful of all. There's more money spent on fighting cancer than just about anything I can think of unless it's fighting wars. And it, uh, so anyway, there's a lot of money there. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, if they ever found a cure for cancer, what would happen to all of that employment? It would be gone. And I have had people in the medical profession tell me quite frankly that they want to find a control for cancer. A control, but not a cure. A control, especially if it's a patented medicine, means that you have an income for life because you can sell your pills or your shots to somebody all their life. They have to have it, they have to have it. They don't care what it costs, they have to have it. And this is the ideal, this is the business model that I discovered exists in the cancer industry. It, it's, a, it's a horrible business model. So having said that, now we deal with what is cancer, and is there a control for it that doesn't cost a lot of money? Is there a cure for it? And I know we don't have a lot of time to go deeply into this, but my conclusions after the, I guess it took me uh, eight years or so to really get into it, um, with a lot of help from doctors and researchers who knew a lot more about it than I, uh, the conclusion was that um, cancer is not caused by something. It's caused by the lack of something. Something in our diet, actually. Now, it's aggravated by well, electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> Incidentally, that's what they use to treat cancer. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. But we all know electromagnetic radiation, radiology, and that kind of stuff causes cancer. And that's what they're using to treat cancer. And it's done with cancer is caused or triggered, I should say, by uh, toxic elements in our environment, maybe a lot of toxic preservatives in our foods and so forth. But the actual, the actual cancer itself, I learned from these professionals, these doctors, is nothing more or less than the healing process of the body fighting against these things. The body heals itself against damage. And it, it's constantly replacing damaged cells. And if it didn't do that, we, wouldn't, we couldn't live. So it's a natural process. And what happens is because of a primarily because of an insufficient dietary substance, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, the ability to heal gets all tweaked. The cells start to reproduce and replace the old dead ones or the sick ones, but then 
it comes to the point where they're already healed. Now what do you do? Well, something happens to the chemical or the electrical and electrical signals that say, okay, it's healed, stop. And it just continues to create new cells. It overheals and continues to heal. And that's what we call cancer. That's sort of an oversimplified view.